Welcome on behalf of Biodesign. Uh, David is going to introduce our uh, honored guest. I just have a couple of things to mention. Uh, one is that please uh, put your phones onto silent mode. We're going to be audio recording this, so uh, that will help. And uh, the next Innovators Workbench is coming up on April 25th, just so that you know. And that'll be Yochi Liu, who's the founder of Biosensors. He'll be talking about that story, uh, but also about his perspective of what's happening in China uh, 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 more broadly. So uh, that'll be a good session. Uh, wanted to say also our thanks to Wilson Sonsini. Uh, Casey McGlynn is here for sponsoring uh, the event this evening. So turn it over to you, David. Thank you, Paul. And I just want to make a note before we get to our esteemed guest tonight that to have in one room Paul Yock, John Simpson, and Tom Fogarty is just extraordinary to me. So, you know, I mean, really. Oh, my gosh. The medical device industry was born in this room right here. Well, we are really fortunate to have Joe Almeida from Baxter here today. And uh, uh, we're going to learn a lot about the Baxter story. But I, I would argue, perhaps incorrectly, that in some ways, when we look back on this decade, a couple of years from now, those of us who are survivors, who are still living at that point, there might be an argument made that Joel made is, was the architect of the modern uh, medical device industry. So Joel, let me begin there. Before we get to the Baxter story, let me begin with uh, your time at Covidian. Uh, I, interviewed, I interviewed you at Covidian around 2012, 2013, probably 2012. And at that time, you were telling me about a long-term strategic plan which I believe you called Covidian 2020. Yeah, we did. Uh, within a year or so, as is widely known, Covidian and Medtronic would merge. And, and by all accounts, you were the driver of that transaction. So I wonder if you could just give us, a, go back to your thinking at the time, what was your rationale for the merger? And, and did it represent a kind of retreat from that uh, original long-term vision for Covidian? The long-term vision for the company was always um, to not only fulfill our mission as a medical technology company to our patients and providers, but also we have a commitment to make the company um, um, feasible for our investors. So we look at the three constituents and have the patients, the providers, employees, and investors. And it's tough to put an order, so I don't do that because it depends upon the audience. Uh, you may get people offended, but the patients are always on the top. So we look at, at Covidian at the time and we said, we need to create some strategic options for the company. We were in businesses that went from bed pans and diapers all the way to neurovascular devices. Uh, the first stroke retrieval system in the market was was uh, other than aspiration mechanical was Covidian uh, under AV3. We had uh, the most successful RF ligation devices in the market under the brand Digashore. We had very successful, the best stapling technology available at that time. Tri-staple was Covidian as well. But we had a lot of legacy products from Kendall, uh, and Kendall were monojack syringes and other things. So we managed a portfolio of businesses, and I always thought that um, in a situation where cost is an imperative, lower operating cost, not manufacturing cost, but operating cost, how do we bring to bear a company that can optimize cost and reinvest in innovation better than anybody else? So our trajectory at Covidian was always one that in 2006, when we conceived the company, um, we had to spend less than 2% in research and development and had the worst, probably the bottom of the pile, innovation indicators of any company. In fact, there was um, the thought at the time where there was the characterization of Covidian as a company that bought companies and stripped out the R&D and exactly. innovation in order to save, in order to, to make the deals work financially. So we had a, a seven-year journey from the time we became public, 2007 to 14, to create one of the most innovative companies and agile companies in healthcare. Then we look at two options. You can buy or you can join. 
And we saw that Medtronic was a phenomenal DNA of innovation. And being in adjacent areas that COVID in were would make a phenomenal combination. And, and then you can synergize the cost as well, because the cost, the fixed cost of a company, the GNA of the company is where you can really synergize. It's the part that is the farthest away from uh, your customers, your patients. So it's the part that you could. So I, I could, so as part of the COVID in 2020, it create the value for our shareholders. We thought that that combination would be unique, because it doesn't work in every case, but would create significant amount of value. Now, you've got to think that the companies need to be managed well, the transition and everything else. But I know in the hands of, of, of a competent CEO, Omar Ishraq could do this. And, and, and I think they today have a wonderful company with significant amount of innovation and doing well. And that was not conceived as part of COVID in 2020, but was conceived as a meaning of creating more value and acceleration of innovation and taking opportunity of two companies that one was significantly more nimble and one could learn from each other. So about the synergistic approach, the learning, the cost, the technology, the invention, the innovation, everything that you can put together. And I think uh, uh, the company still has a great opportunity to continue. Now, Medtronic has a great opportunity and, 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 and a very good leader, uh, Omar, to create and continue to create one of the best healthcare names in the, in, when, in the when world. When you approach Medtronic and broach the idea of a merger, I, mean, I think one thing that, that is, was, is what was widely recognized at the time was, interestingly, for two companies of that size, I think you were number one and number three in the mm -hmm. medtech space, there held little overlap. There was just a handful of categories, drug coated balloons and the like. What was his first reaction? I mean, had you, did you get the sense that he had at least contemplated something similar, or, or was it a surprise? Well, it was a, it was a conversation at the West in, in, in Minneapolis, at the restaurant there. So it, was, it just came about as an opportunity. I don't think he was surprised as much as, you know, we're all anchored by our biases, you know? by our experiences. And, and uh, I, I came from a highly acquisitive background under the former Tyco International, which Covidian was originally part of it, called Tyco Healthcare, that became Covidian. And then you had uh, no, Omar came from GE. And our um, experiences and successes as acquirers were very different. So we had to rebalance our experiences and make sure that uh, um, our good and bad and ugly from the past would not uh, influence a good decision to bring significant value for our patients and for our shareholders. So you were, Covidian was during that time one of the most dynamic, fast growing, most acquisitive companies in that space. And that came after a period of time when there was the well publicized uh, uh, troubles of the early 20s. Did any, was any of that an overhang as Covidian launched in 2007 and you got to 2010? Was any, was there any ripple effect or long-lasting effect from those early 2000 struggles of, of Tyco as in the broader thing? I, there was a period of time when you guys couldn't do deals at all because of the Yeah, so there was no reputational issue because one thing Tyco did, and uh, um, right or wrong, but beneficial to us at COVID at the time, was they were very much a holding company. So we never had any, not even our systems were integrated. We just transmitted our results monthly and quarterly through a, a, through a, a general ledger bridge, and that was it, uh, through Hyperion, and that's it. So we didn't have quality interview. We didn't have supplier management. We didn't have anything. So when the separation came about, uh, it was pretty straightforward, by mm -hmm. the way. Second, reputational, uh, it would be uh, um, entertaining conversations when they ask, oh, you at the party when Dennis, but that was kind of old stuff and nobody wants to talk about that. So because we had nothing to do with Tyco and their misdoings, so, uh, and it was not a misdoing of the company, but it was, was, was misbehavior of the CEO and CFO. Right. It's a different conversation. The two people benefit illegally from and profiteering from and racketeering from the company's uh, uh, coffers, nothing to do with our company. So when we launched, our challenge was actually move from sub 2% research and development budget in, in an innovation that has been completely devastated to a company that could innovate and fight back huge and formidable 
competitors who had a leg up on us for many years of neglect. So that was the biggest challenge we had. The reputation went away when the name changed from Tyco Healthcare to COVID. So obviously, when contemplating the deal, you were thinking of what was best for uh, Covidian. But the reason why I said you might, you, it could be that you will we'll go look back and see Joe made as, as an architect of the medtech industry uh, as it came out of the 2010s. I wonder whether there wasn't a broader context that you were thinking about, some of the dynamics that were going in the marketplace that mm -hmm. made you look and say, we really need to be a corporation of that size, depth, and breadth. And, and I, I mean, in particular, was critical mass uh, becoming an imperative for you as big as Covidian itself mm -hmm. was, did you look and begin to say to yourself, you know what, if we're really going to achieve what we want to achieve, we've got to be bigger. We've got to play on a, we've got a broader platform, a bigger platform. Uh, first, I mentioned about the, the financial benefit that you can have. So you can reinvest, you can give money to your shareholders, but you can reinvest into the company at a larger scale. The second thing is, I think Size has some advantage, not all, because you know uh, products are not purchased on company sizes, but a company size can influence the portfolio and breadth of portfolio of a company. So um, having the ability to test several markets in being the service part of the business, you can only do that with a full portfolio. You cannot go in with one product or two products and say, let me manage the supply of your cath lab or, or, or your OR like COVID was doing in Europe. And if you don't have the breadth of product offering, and I think having that uh, uh, offered a significant advantage. Now, all of those have to be tested, and you have to be nimble enough to react and change course when things are not going on. So it's all test and learn, test and learn, but the assumptions were that not, it's not necessarily bigger, better, better portfolio. Bigger is better. So that deal, in turn, was followed by a bunch of other large consolidating deals, BD's plays for Care Fusion and Bard, Abbott's deal for St. Jude, do you see those deals as coming out, if not in response to Medtronic Covidian, at least, in, at least as part of an effort to uh, accept the terms, accept the assumptions of those mm -hmm. deals, and say, we've got to do something. That Abbott, as big as it was, needed St. Jude. That, that BD, mm -hmm. big as it was, needed Bard and Care Fusion. Do, do you think the consolidation that we've seen post-2014 is in some ways stimulated by, if not driven by, the, the D Medtronic Convenium deal? Um, it may, but I think I go back to the assumption of a better and bigger portfolio is a good thing. Also, you defraying corporate cost is another opportunity. Third is the ability to get into adjacencies that make your portfolio more potent and more diverse. Uh, all of those things played in all the, these, um, these names that you mentioned. And, 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 but the whole thing, folks, don't, don't think for a minute that these acquisitions and integrations are easy. It's all about, after the fact, mm -hmm. how you use that power, how you integrate, how you understand the cultures, and continue on with the best of the best. So the purchasing and signing the check, I would say to you, coming from a, a, a background of, of several acquisitions is the easy thing compared to how to integrate correctly, how to maintain the culture, how to make it work, but also deliver the synergies that you need to deliver to pay for the acquisition, for the, for the, 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 the weighted average cost of capital plus the, the amortization of your premium through the return on your internal rate of return. So I would say that um, I think all these acquisitions that you mentioned have tremendous um, logic behind. Um, need to make sure that they're getting executed right. I, I think one thing that's interesting is if you think about the roll-up of companies that formed Tyco Healthcare, later Covidian, they were also different in corporate cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, da uh, Davis & Geck, uh, Sherwood, uh, U.S. Surgical, unlike any other company in this industry. And the Malincrot. Between those companies, yeah, Malincrot doing those. I, I wanted to touch on one other part of the Covidian story before we get to Baxter, and, and that uh, is Covidian's collaboration with the Foundry to launch Fire One. Mm -hmm. Every time I, I talk to Hanson 
Gifford and Mark Dean, they remind me that you personally uh, drove that deal, that, that from Covidian's perspective, mm -hmm. this was not something that came through the corporate ventures or the biz development, but you were the champion of that deal. Can you describe what Fire One is, what about it appealed to you, and what it says about your view of, of technology development and really company building on the other, send, other side of the scale, not the big consolidating mega mm -hmm. deals, but really investing very early in the technology. So um, I want to give credit to Stacy X and Seng who brought um, that idea and we start talking about it. And the, the, the thing that I, um, and if you talk to my colleagues at Baxter and talk to my former colleagues at Covidian, you were going to ask them, I have a sense of urgency that is uh, uh, quite, quite acute. And sometimes I think we don't take enough risk in our large companies because the reward sometimes, despite the fact you try to change that culture, is not there. Why am I here today? I'm not here today just to be here talking to you. David, I'm here today and I had an opportunity to talk to the biodesign folks. We're, we had people being trained by Baxter here. Uh, um, and we're going to have more work done with biodesign because like FAR1 was how many, what is your process to create that unmet need opportunity? And how do you really screen through that to get to a number of programs or projects that are doable and get to one that you may want to invest at a company? The bureaucracy to get at this point, and, 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 and my, my objective for BACS, we're going to take this process internally. We're going to work continually with, with budget, but take it internally to be able to prove that a large company can do something like that. Because at that moment, we couldn't. Uh, so at Covidian, we had a great innovation, but we have a greatly innovative company on adjacencies and creation of good iterations and advancing our portfolio. But the ability to create something from unmet needs uh, didn't come. We bought EV3, it was a great company to buy. I was talking to Brett Wall yesterday <coughs> at dinner and, and the neurovascular business of that, of, of, of used to be EV3 and then went to COVID and now Medtronic, is, is, is five, six fold what we, what we used to be. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't do that at COVID until we went and bought mm -hmm. someone. So the fire one was the ability to let's get something done, not even internally, that can give us bear some fruits. We had investments in renal denervation. Who remembers the my renal denervation? <laughs> we only paid 40 million bucks, by the way. Some people paid a billion bucks for that business. And, uh, but, the, 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 but we paid $40 million and learned that doesn't work that well, okay? doesn't work that well, not the way it was designed, at least the one that we purchased. So you've got a, that kind of risk aversion. Echo video was really difficult. Yeah. Really, really difficult. So far, one was an example. I, I, I appreciate they give me the credit. The credit goes to Stacey X and Seng, who uh, 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 I had dinner with her last night and is still very engaged in many aspects of healthcare. Is a great, is a great professional. Well, I, 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 I uh, just re remind you that Hanson and, and Mark give you a lot of Credit for that, not to undermine Stacy's uh, uh, role kind. in it. They're kind. So the obvious next question is the degree to which you'll begin to do those kinds of things. And I think your point about big companies being risk averse and, and unable or unwilling to look at that is a very interesting one. But before we get to, to those specific questions, let's just set some background for Baxter because it may not be as well known in this community as uh, it is more broadly. I can understand why uh, Baxter would want you to be CEO. Why did you want to be CEO of Baxter? Who, who is Baxter, mm -hmm. and, and what opportunities did you see? Well, when you're unemployed, you look at everything. <laughs> <laughs> so. You needed to put food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Baxter is a name that I grew up with because when I worked for Kendall Healthcare, who remembers Kendall Healthcare here? I unfortunately oh, don't. see that. See people gray like me saying, yes, I remember <laughs> that. The younger people, what are you talking about? Yeah. They don't know what Kendall Square yeah. <laughs> refers to. So Kendall was a small medical device company, and we made urine bags and, and, and uh, Foley catheters and, and urine meters and all this stuff. And we were partners with Baxter when Baxter used to have American Hospital Supply. 
And, and I remember going to the hospital. My father was an anesthesiologist and seeing Baxter uh, IV in those you know, bottles in those days, not bags hanging. So I, Edwards Life Science was an independent company. It was bought by Baxter and divested by Baxter. Caremark, we used to be part of Baxter, which is now right. part of CVS. So many things, so the reputation of the company. And what happened, the company just fell off the, the radar screen for everyone. I don't know what happened to Baxter. It went under uh, uh, in a witness protection program and, and it was not surfacing. So I said, what an opportunity to uh, you know, go to the company um, and create something new, affect the culture, take the learnings for three and a half years as CEO of COVID, but 20 years working there as Kendall, Tyco Healthcare, and COVID, and take some of those learnings and bring to a company and transform the company and make this into a great journey. So did you, you frame it that way because when I first got into this industry, you know, in the late 19th century, um, Medtronic was a small CRM company, uh, Boston Scientific and Guidant didn't exist. In those days, the medical device industry was more of a hospital supplies industry, and if you wanted to go to its center, you went to the Midwest, and specifically the area north of Chicago, Baxter, Abbott, American Hospital Supply. Mm -hmm. The really high-tech medtech centers would evolve later, places like Palo Alto, Orange County, Minneapolis. Culturally, do you see what you're trying to do as bring a culture closer to Palo Alto, to an Orange County, to Baxter, or do you see a value in the kind of historic roots of Baxter mm -hmm. and that old hospital supplies uh, community? All together. So what are the things that we want our cultural values to be known for? Um, speed, um, courage, adaptability, drive for results, things that characterize a company that has a great mission of saving and sustaining lives. That caught, you know, when you go in and you start mo moving things and you start redefining mission, I didn't need to touch the mission of the company because it, it, it absolutely resonates with everything that in my almost 27 years in healthcare I've learned. Saving and sustaining lives. Then think about getting those four or five values and working very hard to embed them in the company. And this is not about talking. You go and you take layers out of the company. You combine jobs. You replace people. You travel around the globe a few times a year to see people face to face. So the cultural change of the company is, and the right mix of people in the company are the ones, the two ingredients that will create the Baxter of the future, because the Baxter of the past, we know, innovative company, designed and invent so many different therapies, but a company that forgot how to innovate, and the ecosystem of innovation all but disappeared, and the company became very process-driven, process-oriented, and focused on quarter-to-quarter -quarter results, and highly dependent on an orphan series of orf orphan drugs that got, when I came to the company, divested into a company called, not divested, but spun off in back salted, they be became Shire, part of Shire, because Shire acquired them six months later. So the company has no outlet anymore. There's no single product that has 95% gross margin, selling billions of dollars a year. Now you need to take what you have, get a great culture, great people, and do it. Being in the Midwest is not a problem. The problem, if you think being in the Midwest is a problem, because then you will create all these um, excuses to move headquarters. You know, when you start moving headquarters, my friend, and your CEO, things go downhill quite fast, okay? Because you're more concerned about changing the location than really changing the culture. We have great employees at Baxter, some of them sitting here today, great people, frustrated to death of working for a company that had got stuck in the 90s. So it doesn't take much to get them motivated and look at the results of the company. The last two years, they speak for themselves, not the results that I generated, but the results that they did. They well, generated. you brought in folks like Dennis Crowley from Covidian I did. In, in business development. Was, it a, was your function to be a change agent as far as 
the folks who are there or to give the folks who are there mm -hmm. a new mandate, a new mission, a new vision of what Baxter could be? So remember I said we need the right people for the job. You can go to H HBS, Harvard Business School, you can go to Stanford, you can go to Yale, you can go to Dartmouth, you can go to uh, 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 Georgia Tech, get the best engineers, best MBAs. What you want is are the right people for the job. So I needed somebody really good in business development. We got it. I need somebody really good in strategy. I got David Roman from Goldman Sachs. I needed a really good person in Europe because I didn't have one. Our business in Europe was not doing well. We got Christiana Franz, who used to work for me at Covita. I need somebody good in Asia. I got Andy Fry. Andy didn't work for me. He came from Abbott through a distributor in Thailand. He's in America, I believe 12 years in, in, in Asia. He's managing Asia for us. I need somebody really strong in communication. Stacey Eisen came, we brought her from Pfizer. So we brought people and mixed. We had a great HR person, Gene Mason is a great HR person, was with Baxter. My CFO and, and all his team, all from Baxter, great people, by the way. Finance and Baxter are one of the strongest uh, uh, finance groups I ever worked with. So we mixed the people and got exactly what you read in the, in the book, Moneyball. You've got to get the right picture for the right person at bat. You've got to get the right uh, center. You've got to get the right first base. You've got to get the right people there, and then that combination. Because how do you think would pan out if I went in and replaced my team by everybody who worked for me directly at COVID? Not, it would not work well. It's not the same company, first of all. And the changes are completely different that we need to, to, to impinge there. Secondly, none of these folks that I brought in from COVID that worked directly for me. They worked in the organization, but not for me. Great. So as you mentioned, over the past several decades, Baxter's portfolio, I don't want to say seemed incoherent at times, but it, it, it jumped all over the place. For a long time, it was a pure hospital supply, blood products, IV solutions. It, as you mentioned, it toyed with being a biotech company for a while, and following its acquisition of American Hospital Supply, it was a major hospital distributor. Does any of that still define Baxter? H how do you see, what are the key components of Baxter's product portfolio today? And five years from now, do you think it'll look different? Uh, we'll look slightly different, because all we have six global business units. The way we organize is very simple. We have general managers who manage global business units across all the geographies of the world. They're responsible for research and development, innovation, product portfolio, and upstream marketing and product launches. Every region of the world, three, have people do sales and marketing downstream. Pretty straightforward. So they, they intersect in the regions with specific portfolios. So the, the BUs in the company have the, the responsibility and have to create 10-year pipelines. 10-year pipelines and the portfolio needs to have enough adjacency in settings post and pre-hospital. So home and before that pre-treatment. So we have a, a pre-established um, where to play and how to play. So that will drive product development. So you're going to see some different things coming out of Baxter. For instance, we're going to see some monitoring products coming out of Baxter because we are in the IV space and we are an ICU company as well. I don't know if you know, we have infusion pumps, the antibiotics, the IV solutions. We have the continuous renal replacement therapy machines. So we have a significant footprint in some areas of the hospital. So that is driving other things, either organically or inorganic. So you see, this is how you acquire companies. It's through a strategy, not from opportunistic, let me get bigger kind of, kind of conversation. So looking at the portfolio, so it will look different. You see us with many more injectable molecules today, cytotoxic injectables that we didn't have in the past. You will see us getting more into the ICU space, critical care. We see us expanding in the, in the, in the renal care with a point of care at home for peritoneal dialysis, which in going in countries like Indonesia and working with the governments to put renal clinics and things of this sort. So you see us getting into other areas of, of care which are not traditionally, were not traditionally in the original portfolio of Baxter. So uh, major product lines? Uh, major product lines for us. Where are you going to put your emphasis? Uh, our emphasis are going in medication management. We have a, a new set of pumps being launched this year, and in 2020, a brand new, very intelligent devices. Um, other is injectable, um, injectable drugs, uh, mixed, or in powder form, 
Uh, we have operations in India, uh, in Germany, and the U.S., which can make that. Um, our renal care group is also very important. Um, our advanced surgery has great products. We just actually closed the acquisition this week of two new two molecules that we acquired from Mellencrod. They will go right into the bag of our of our sales team. And lastly, we're going to put quite a bit of emphasis in our acute renal care, which links quite a bit with medication management in the ICU. So. The Covidian of 2010 looked a lot different from the, from the Tyco Healthcare of 2000. And a lot of that was uh, driven by an M&A strategy that uh, seemed to be extraordinarily successful, at least from the outside. Can, you've talked about uh, Baxter's intentions and plans around uh, M&A, but I wonder if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Do you see, COVID, do you see Baxter being as aggressive an acquirer as uh, Covidian was, and, and what area specifically? I mean, will you use I MNA? Mean, you talked about or, in or, uh, organic and, and, and inorganic as a pro technology, but do you see MNA as a tool to build on existing franchises to get you into new areas? Who ever thought Covidian mm -hmm. would do renal denervation? Exactly, but I want to remind you folks that Covidian had a very, very aggressive and successful organic pipeline. The inorganic was a supplement got us into things such as neurovascular, peripheral vascular, um, got us into some early technology for lung navigation and other things, but we had a significant amount of launches on it. So acquisitions, M&A is not any strategy. Just keep that in mind. You can buy yourself, in, can buy enough companies to be successful. You've got to be able to have innate capability for developing products and creating momentum within, within your portfolio. Because the amount of money that you spend buying companies, just your internal rate of return is not enough. The internal rate of return of an internally developed product is much higher than one acquired. But you need the acquire because you may not have the intellectual property, you may not have the ability to bring that to bear. So for Baxter, it's the same thing. We have, I don't know if people know here, but Baxter has a pristine balance sheet. We actually, at the end of the year, will be positive on the, on the net debt over the next 12-month EBITDA. We have no debt to speak of. Um, and positive operating cash flow is very seldomly found in companies like ours. So we have a great capacity to buy companies. But that is not a license to be stupid and sign checks for big checks to buy companies that don't accrue value to our shareholders and to our company. So we, we will buy things. Uh, now that our portfolio is reshaped, we understand the adjacencies we want to participate. Like I said, we just bought some stuff for a couple products for, for advanced surgery. We bought an injectable plant in, in, um, in, in India to be able to, to have the cost position to bring the products into the U.S. And we're looking at other opportunities. And we'll do that very methodically and disciplined because we don't want to have acquisitions that have ROIC that only becomes company average in 10 years. So our ROIC is three to five years. Our returns have to be 400, 500 basis points above weighted average cost of capital for the company, which is about 7%. So we, there is a threshold minimum that we do these things. We will never do a deal that the WAC, that, that your internal rate of return is 50 basis points above a WAC. But there's, so, so that is, from my perspective, is not a good use of our shareholders' cash. Yeah, you know, a senior executive in this industry once said to me that when big companies talk about deals having to be accretive, he said, don't kid yourselves, no deal's ever accretive. The question is how quickly do dilutive do deals become accretive and can the company see that in the short term? Could you see yourself with that balance sheet? Um, or I, I, let me ask it this way, how, uh, are, how comfortable are you with dilutive deals, deals that will not pay off for several years down the road? Balance, balance, balance. You do 10 deals, they are dilutive. Five cents a year. 10 multiplied by five is 50 cents. Doesn't work. Just do the math, you divide uh, net income by the number of outstanding shares, you're gonna see how many dollars per share, percent of share, per percent of earnings, and you look above 50 cents of dilution is a truckload of dilution. And that will not go well. You can't you can talk yourself out of it with your investors. So this senior executive, then he's not a, or she is not 100% incorrect. The way we look at deals today, 
in the way I look. That's why I look at the ROIC and internal rate of return. Because when you talk about accretion, accretion has many different ways of being calculated. There's gap accretion, non-gap accretion. How many of you have business degrees here in the audience? About probably one-fifth of the audience. So we start looking into, into how you calculate accretion. It can be quite tricky because a lot of people exclude all the amortization of the deals from your cash flows, which is called cash EPS. Have you heard of this name, cash EPS? So when you do cash EPS, which everybody uses, it doesn't have the, so the, 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 the accretion is quite automatic. It has to be. So that's why I don't look at accretion as the only thing. What we look at is return on invested capital, meaning your goodwill goes up, your ROIC goes down. And you have three to five years to get a debt ROIC up to where it used to be, otherwise it's not a good deal. So now you're talking about real value creation terms. So we need to be careful because having good money, and listen, we have debt capacity is very good. We, we said publicly that we don't want to have more than, than, than two times, um, you know, am I correct? I'm talking to Claire in the back here. She's head of investor relations. I want to, she's with me because we're doing also investor tour. And I want to make sure I'm not making a huge mistake by giving bad numbers in the public, in a non-public audience. So it's about two times our, our, our um, debt level, so our EBIT. EBITDA. So that's a lot of money that we can borrow and we can generate. We have a pretty healthy uh, cash flow, but you become quite dangerous with that checkbook, by the way, because it becomes pretty tempting to go buy stuff, unless, unless it's stuff that Dr. Fogarty invents. <laughs> if, that, if, if that is, uh, <laughs> then we go and buy. That's not a problem. So Stan Rowe of Edwards just uh, wrote an article for uh, our publication, and, and he pointed out that in 2010, I don't think these were specific to med tech companies, I think these were broadly in industry br branches, when big companies uh, prioritized what to do with their cash, they spent most on R&D, second most on uh, return to shareholders, and third on M&A. By 2015, 2016, that had reversed completely. Mm -hmm. They spent most money on M&A, second on cash, and last on R&D. As you think about both your experience at Covidian and what you would like to accomplish at, at uh, Baxter, do you see that shift from an R&D driven innovation to an M&A driven portfolio building as a, um, as a healthy trend? Do you think it's a uh, short term uh, you know, kind of solution? to, to mm -hmm. some shareholder pressures. How, how much do you think that that trend, reversal trend, is, is, a, is a positive or a problematic uh, so David, evolution? So David, I don't know the context because I don't know the universe. But if you, let's say healthcare in general, let's exclude providers, hospitals, okay? Uh, there was a shift. If you look at Valiant, look at Mellencrot, and a couple other companies, they completely abdicated their research and development budgets to an acquisition budget. And you, you see how it, it, it ends up. It doesn't, it doesn't end up well in cases because you don't have enough. You can't buy enough to create growth in the company. And people know what's organic, what's not, right? The second thing, from my perspective at Baxter, um, R&D is where we spend the money. Um, and then we have a choice. R&D, no compromise. Then we have a choice. We can do two or three things. We can buy companies. We can return money to the shareholders in two different vehicles, either buy back shares or, 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 or getting our dividends. And I think we can do the three of them. We can buy companies, return money to the shareholders in the two forms. We've been increasing our dividends for, for a very long time and we continue to have a policy of paid dividends, and, and we evaluate every year the, the, if we're gonna increase the dividend or not, and when we do, we announce. Um, and we buy, we just got an authorization of uh, $2.2 billion to buy shares back. Why is that? Nothing compromises R&D. 
that comes first. Then, if you don't find the right match, you should not be sitting in a lot, on a lot of cash. In returning to the shareholder is a good option, and you do it through share buyback. So it's a balanced approach, but the order which the, the conversation went and his research, which I'm sure is correct, is that companies are sometimes abdicating their own research to buy. Remember when you buy, you pay a significant premium. Second thing, you are also buying uh, risk, and sometimes you're buying risk that you don't know. So let's talk about just one technology that I had experience with renal denervation. We purchased, it was a good technology, it was good, good thinking. We understood the risk, but not everybody did. And when the, when the things could not, we could not get the cohort correctly, which was a clinical trial design, things went backwards. And investments that were made in that technology went from the balance sheet to the P&L. And that's a transition that's called write-off. So um, it proves to you that sometimes as you think, and then you take another acquisition, Medtronic bought core valve. That was a great acquisition for Medtronic. So there are good stuff, but you always have inherent risk in everything you do. And there's a higher risk of buying technology because you, you despite the fact that all they do the, the, the diligence, you may have inherent risk that you may not be quantifying versus something that you may know that is in-house that you have. Or you need to buy something early enough and then you share the risk with the seller. But I think you need to be careful with abdicating your right to be an innovator and subjugate that activity to somebody else. So uh, as I mentioned before, Baxter's roots are uh, in hospital supply and it was one of the great hospital supply companies, particularly once it acquired American Hospital Supply. The hospital supply companies, in contrast to med companies like Medtronic and late stage Covidian were, mm -hmm. tended to be lower margins and tended to be closer to a different kind of customer at the, uh, in, in the hospital. They tended mm -hmm. to deal more with materials management, more with the administrative office. I wonder how you see the growing presence and strength of the so-called economic buyer today shaping where innovation in this industry is going and, and, and shaping what kind of innovation comes forward. Uh, and, and whether Baxter has a kind of uh, advantage in this, in this space, uh, specifically because of its mm -hmm. roots. So let's think about the profile of Baxter. Baxter has a gross margin of 44%, 44, 45%. Um, oh, only that, yeah. But our SGNA is 22%. Our sales and general administration is 22%. Sometimes a company has 73% of gross margin, but they have 35 to 38% of SGNA. So it's all relative. It's all relative. So we make good money, good cash flow, but we don't have physician preferred product for the most part. Some of our folks sitting here from, from Baxter on the left side of here, the auditorium, they are responsible for this part of the country for our advanced surgery. They deal with physician preferred product. But it still has to have an economic buyer sign off, otherwise you don't even step foot in your OR. Am I correct? Okay. So economic buyer today is the denominator that is common to everyone no matter what no matter what, and we need to be aware of that. Being 73 or 44 is relative. We've got a, a good executive, knows how to operate in any one of those stratospheres. We have products at Baxter, which are 95% gross margin. I have cytotoxic drugs for chemotherapy, they're 90 plus percent gross margin. We have products that are about 30% gross margin. You've gotta give the attention correctly, so what makes Baxter, a company that tested me as an executive, was the ability to modulate between them. Because you can innovate across the board. It doesn't need to be a, a tether conversation for you to be innovative. You can innovate in how you compound drugs in the pharmacy for safety of the patient, and you can make a significant amount of inroads and make a lot of money in that. So I want to clarify that because it is all about how you manage your portfolio, manage the expenses to go to market. 
So uh, I, how much do you think cost, which is important to the economic buyer, will shape or frame the way companies innovate in the, in the, in the future? I mean, there's a lot of talk today about the shift from value, volume to value, uh, addressing the value needs of customers. There's obviously a difference between cost and value. And does it become a slippery slope for med tech companies to focus on value because in the end it becomes simply mm -hmm. a discussion about lower cost, lower margins, et cetera, et cetera? If you go to an institution and the only thing you can show is a small cohort of clinical trial patients that got you enough statistical relevance to get your product approved in a certain geography, FDA or SFDA or, or ML, MLHW in, uh, in, in Japan, it doesn't matter. But your economic data is poor, no matter how good your product is, you're gonna have a real hard time selling that product. We have a product that is fantastic, but Baxter did not, invi did, did not invest at all in the clinical trials. Today we're putting $25 million behind that specific uh, product. It's a dialyzer, it's a very innovative way of, is the closest to a kidney than any other product on the market, but we didn't have the clinical data. So when we told our sales force, go sell this product and charge, you now we're gonna, the, pri the price point in our analysis is gonna be X, which is higher than the average dialyzer. They couldn't sell the product. So it doesn't matter how it doesn't matter how good your your product is. If you don't prove it, you're going to have much smaller penetration, much smaller and shorter uh, and, and longer. I'm sorry, rather uh, time to pick sales. That is the whole thing. You can have the technology. How long does it take to get adopted? Mm -hmm. So you've got to have the societies behind you, the societies, you have got to have the healthcare economic, you've got to be able to save the hospital some money, some way, somehow, otherwise it becomes really difficult. So we're right at putting up against time. Let me ask you just a couple more questions, and then we will take questions from the audience if there are any. We talked at the beginning about the consolidation in this industry, which one could argue was, was, was uh, a response to the Medtronic Covidian merger. Today, there's a, a still several large multinational companies that remain independent. Boston Scientific, Zimmer, which is now run by a former Covidian uh, executive, Edwards, and you could put Baxter in that bucket. Do you think we'll see be seeing more consolidation over the course of the next couple of years? Well, David, you know uh, my uh, crystal ball broke last week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dog. Ate it. <laughs> Ate it. And when it came out, it was broken. So we don't, uh, it's tough to say, you know. Uh, um, I think what you, one thing you can say is mid cap company, companies are disappearing pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, so you have large companies and you have very, very small companies, but something in between is, is becoming less and less uh, uh, prominent. Um, so it's tough to, uh, to uh, 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 you know, predict what's going to happen, but you've got to always, always uh, make sure that you are creating the value, the cost, not only for the shareholders but also for your customers. Run your company well. Never run your company with intention to sell unless you are in bio design and this is what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so and, let, uh, let me ask that question a different way and understand the spirit in which I ask it. Whenever I talk to executives like Mike Nussbaum of Edwards or Mike Mahoney of, of, of Boston, I've always taken it back when they describe their companies as small, particularly when compared to Johnson & Johnson Medtronic. And I'm assuming you might say the same thing about Baxter, to be honest with you. We talked before about some of the forces that, or some of the rationale that led to the medtronic mm -hmm. Convenient merger. Don't, doesn't the medtronic Convenient deal raise the same kind of questions about the future of a company like Baxter. Where do you see Baxter fitting in into the med tech uh, uh, constellation mm -hmm. uh, going forward? That's what I don't see, because Baxter is not a med tech company, purely. Baxter has med tech products. We are also a pharmaceutical company. So we are a company under CDRH, FDA. We're a company into CDER, CDER. And we're a company into CBER. We have them all. 
So we're not a pure play medical device company. Remember, Covidian was a pure play once the company spun off Mellencrot. Um, uh, all the other companies, CR Bard was a pure play. We're not a pure play. We're a hybrid company. And, and, and I think we are much better off independent that we'll be able to create more value to our shareholders. Yeah, although as compared independent. to pharmaceutical companies, you're even smaller than you are oh, Medtronic and Johnson. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So, but, but then who, who do you compare us with? There's, Fresenius is one of them. Mm -hmm. So there's very few comparatives to Baxter, and there's one, one advantage because you compete in different areas and you have the ability to shape your portfolio more uh, acutely without a significant and intensity of three, four, five competitors all the time. So the company has great end markets. And, and if we do well and, and, and execute one Baxter strategy that we have, put it, we're gonna be telling more to our investors in May uh, in New York City, you will see that we will have a much stronger company going forward than anything that you do in terms of acquisitions. I don't represent, I represent my shareholders, and you, you, you can never uh, uh, turn your back on anything, but I tell you, our company has nothing to do with, with COVID, and it's not, it's not the same environment, it's not the same products, it doesn't have the same synergies, and you look at our products, are not synergistic to almost any of those companies. Great. Well, I think uh, that's, it's been a wonderful 50 minutes. I think Thank we you, all can recognize why Baxter's in so much better hands and coming out of that, that wilderness, that lost time. So let's, let's thank Joe. And we've got a couple minutes for questions. If anybody wants to uh, come to the, uh, well, either shout it loudly or go to the microphone. But yeah, Joe, thank, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anurag Merol, by design. Last time I saw you, Joe, this was in Singapore at the Asia Pacific MedTech Forum. Yes. And this was the, the your focus of your keynote was innovation. Uh, what better place to to uh, focus on that? I'm trying to you. learn innovation. That's why I came here. <laughs> you you made a very interesting uh, comment at, at, at that uh, keynote. You said, uh, I think you were talking about chronic kidney disease treatment in Asia Pacific and how a lot of patients were not getting the therapy they need. And I think the, the point you were making was that the problem is that the most solutions are not really chasing the need. Uh, and that's why they're, they, they, these patients are not getting the solutions they, they, they deserve. Um, how are you changing that at, at Baxter? Build versus buy, mm -hmm. but how, how, are you, how, how is it changing at Baxter? And uh, the, could you give some examples of the that? The biggest fallacy is to think that these featuring your product and putting them in, in Asia or other emerging markets is going to solve the problems. And they never solve because the cost never goes down, so it's a loose a lose-lose proposition. Emerging markets for Baxter is not China. China is $800 million for Baxter compared to our size. Emerging markets, if you do, is 23 plus percent of our sales. Emerging markets for us is Indonesia, is Malaysia, parts of South America. So let's take Indo Indo Indonesia, for instance. We're working with the government in Indonesia to create dialysis clinics, mostly focused on peritoneal dialysis, to be able to create CDK treatment, pre-dialysis, we have the technology and the ability to do it. We do it in Colombia extremely well, one of the best in the world. Our clinics are rated. And we're doing the same, and we'll be doing the same in Indonesia. And we'll be signing a, 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 you know, agreements with the government to be able to provide that service and that technology to, to them and provide them with the product which is adaptable to that geography. And we'll come up with something between PD Gravity and PD cycler, which is much more effective, something in between for countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, countries such as, um, as Philippines. And logistically speaking, it's is very difficult. Indonesia has 180 million people spreading islands everywhere. So how can Baxter play a role with the government in solving an untreated disease for the most part in Indonesia? So let me, let me build on that question uh, just by asking, I mean, you talked about your uh, long history at Tyco and Covidi, and now you're at Baxter, but some people may not know that you actually started as a consultant. Do you have any thoughts about oh, how... Jesus. What's that? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about how innovation is different in the healthcare space than it is in other industries? Um, I think aviation or aerospace, you kind of put on the side, but our industry is highly regulated. So yesterday there was a forum down in... Uh, in Laguna Niguel on, from Fortune, and the conversation was about borderless world, and I said, it's not only about, we don't have universal clinical trials. We don't have the same criteria to, 
to approve products in different countries. So it becomes highly difficult and highly costly for us as an industry to be able to get products on a global basis. So our portfolio sometimes looks like a Swiss cheese. You know, holes everywhere. And what we're doing at Baxter is filling those gaps in creating value, like Indonesia and other places that don't have our products today. And why they don't have? Because the cost of registering products. And, and, and so somebody in the audience said, well, but now they have the unifying clinical trial. Yeah, they are. But the approval of the product in the country is still a problem and it's still quite difficult. So until we create more uniform ways of accepting data and streamlining approvals and uniform approvals, it's going to be very difficult to disseminate technology that is good for everyone everywhere. So I'm sorry I stepped on. I just have a very, very quick follow-up. It's yeah. tongue-in-cheek. Uh, you must have seen this news about Uber and Lyft getting into patient transfer. Since yeah. kind of chronic kidney disease, patient transfer is a, is a big challenge twice a week treatment. Mm -hmm. Do you think Baxter would get into that? Uh, I don't think so. We have one of the largest fleets in the country in the United, in the United States. We deliver to more than 35,000 plus thousand patients uh, um, peritoneal dialysis treatments. We have our own fleet and, uh, and I always say if somebody can do better, great. I don't think it's going to be Lyft, neither Uber. Uh, we need to be reliable and they need to be able to deliver the right solution to people's homes, otherwise they're going to be injuring the patients. So, but I'm, I'm glad they're transporting. Is a very effective taxi service. <laughs> well, great. Well, as we can see, as I said before, I, I think you could hardly imagine Baxter in better hands going forward. Joe, again, I want to thank you very David, much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And there's a reception thank just you. outside. David, very kind. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much.